I had all day to get ready. You think I'd be ready? Well, it's a, as everybody else said, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, it's wonderful to be invited to come and teach at a men's conference. And it's been an awesome day so far, hasn't it? Great food, great teaching, just uh, both physical food and spiritual food. And so um, I'm just blessed to be able to share in that and share with you guys in that. And so before I go any further, let's just ask the Lord to bless this time in his word again. Heavenly Father, we, we come before you and Lord... As we continue to march through your word, as we continue to um, mine Paul's words for all that they have for us, all that you desire for us to get from it, we just ask, Lord, that you would just continue to um, give us the energy of mind, the, the fortitude of our, of our strength to stay awake, help us to just be able to uh, in, endure and continue on and Father, just impress your word upon our hearts. Help us to live as new men, transformed by your love. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm not used to not being in the driver's seat for the presentation, so I did give them a copy of my teaching, so it should be following along with, and as long as you guys don't look at me confused, I'll know that the behind me is okay. And so uh, I've titled my message, Transformed Living. Uh, because the gospel of Jesus Christ gives the one who believes in it and surrenders in it, it gives us new life. Not just eternal life, but new life eternal. It's not the old life made eternal. It's life entirely new. Jesus described it to Nicodemus in John chapter 3 as being born again. Birth being the identification of new life. New life that must now grow and mature. And Jesus, speaking of the spiritual life, said one must be born again. Not of water only, but of water and of spirit. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, Paul says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, and see, the new has come. And so know today that anyone here in Christ Jesus is a new creation. The promise is that the old has passed away and that the new has come. And so that's what we're talking about today. We're talking about the new man, that all of us here in Christ Jesus are that new man. Going back to some verses that we covered earlier in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 21, Paul said, assuming you heard about him and were taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus. Take off your former way of life, the old self that is corrupted by deceitful desires, to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self, the one created according to God's likeness and righteousness and the purity of the truth. The new man is entirely different from the old man. As new men were called to transformed living. The old is gone. It's passed away. We've been given new life, and we've been given the Holy Spirit dwelling with inside us, and his presence in our life empowers us to transformed living. And the new man, as new men, our desire should be to live in such a way that we honor God. Being a new creation in righteousness according to God's likeness and truth, it should impact our lives not only as sons, but as fathers and as workers and leaders. Being born again and filled with the Holy Spirit as a new man in Christ Jesus, this should impact every area of our life as men. But our focus right now is on those four things as sons, fathers, workers, and leaders. Putting on the new man and being the new man calls us to transformed living. If you guys would open up, we're in Ephesians chapter 6, and I'm going to be taking you through the first nine verses. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, because this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may go well with you and that you may have a long life in the land. Fathers, don't stir up anger in your children, but bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Slaves, Obey your human masters with fear and trembling, in sincerity of your heart as you would Christ. 
Don't work only while being watched as people pleasers, but as slaves of Christ. Do God's will from your heart. Serve with a good attitude as to the Lord, not to people, knowing that whatever good each one does, slave or free, he will receive this back from the Lord. And masters, treat your slaves the same way without threatening them, because you know that both their master and yours is in heaven, and there is no favoritism with him. So as we go through and we're looking at transformed living, I want to look at transformed living, and we're going to look at the child, the son. In the first three verses, he said, Children, obey your parents and the Lord because this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment, with a promise, so that it may go well with you and that you may have a long life in the land. Now, I know I'm not just speaking to my two boys that I brought here, so this is not meant just for those under the age of 18. Paul is speaking to anyone who is a child, and if you are here this morning, you've been born, you are a child. You are a child of someone. And Paul's instruction is that children are to obey their parents. Obey in the Greek is hupakouau, upakuo. I had to phonetically write it out so that I would say it right. It's a tip for anybody that has to pronounce names or anything like that. It means to hear under authority. Speaking of hearing as being under the authority of someone else. The language written here expects that it would be a habitual, constant obedience to the commands. And that word speaks of like a soldier about to engage in battle. When they are in that room and they're getting the mission briefing, they are listening intently through the orders and the instructions from his commanding officer. If one did not listen carefully and they go out, they could end up in the wrong place at the wrong time. And it could cost them their very life. Or maybe you prefer an analogy with uh, sports. So it would be like the football team in the red zone. And it's the last seconds of the game. They got time for one play. They're in that huddle. How intently do you think they're listening to the quarterback as he calls out that player or to the play call coming through, knowing they have to hear and execute lest they cost their team the victory. And so... The command to obey one's parents is a call for one to obey as if everything is on the line. It's not a blind call to obedience because there's a qualifier that Paul put in here, and that's to obey your parents in the Lord. This is not obedience to obey only if your parents are in the Lord. It's not saying you only have to obey your parents if they're in the Lord. But to obey parents whether or not they're in the Lord, and there's a couple meanings that go along with this. First. Your obedience should be done with an attitude of obeying the Lord himself. Secondly, it points to obedience in all matters that are in alignment with the will of God. If the parent calls for a child to sin, you should simply not comply. In such a case, the expectation is a courteous refusal and a willingness to suffer the consequences. And you should do so because this is right. Not only is it the created and natural order that's fitting, but also because it is lawful and righteous. Moving from the order of obedience, the overall attitude and demeanor towards one's parents, Paul says, honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise. Honor them, give them a place of esteemed and high respect. This is the place that the Lord has given them in your life. This exhortation from Paul comes from the commandment given in Exodus and repeated again in Deuteronomy. Exodus 20, verse 12. Honor your father and mother so that you may have a long life in the land that your Lord God is giving you. Deuteronomy 5, 16. If you remember Deuteronomy, the name of that book is the law again. Honor your father and mother as the Lord your God has commanded you, so that you may live long and so that you may prosper in the land the Lord your God has given you. The first of the Ten Commandments with a specific promise attached to it. Children are to respect, love, and obey their parents, and it is in their best interest to do so. And the promise is that it may be well with you in the land, that you may have a long life. It doesn't promise that you will because we all know and we've all seen that there are dutiful sons that die early. 
But one who obeys has a better likelihood at living well and living long than one who's disobedient and not given to authority, especially the authority of their own parents. And we see this time and time played out before us in the news where there is a son that is not respectful, that is not submitted to authority, especially the authority of their parents, and most often their life ends early. You see, an Israelite who persistently disobeyed, they were not privileged to a long life. A life of rebellion, a life of recklessness would end prematurely. Deuteronomy 21 verse 18, if a man has a stubborn and rebellious son who does not obey his father or mother and doesn't listen to them, even after they discipline him, his father and mother are to take hold of him and bring him to the elders of his city, to the gate of his hometown. They will say to the elders of the city, this son of ours is stubborn and rebellious. He doesn't obey us. He's a glutton and a drunkard. Then all the men of the city will stone him to death. You must purge the evil from among you and all Israel will hear and be afraid. Notice something there. When they took their son before him, they're not taking a child. They're not taking a young child. Said he's a glutton and a drunkard. Disobedience is a symptom of those who are immature, impulsive, and inexperienced. Disobedience of children towards their parents is one of the signs given for the end times as well. Proverbs chapter 30 verse 11 says, There's a generation that curses its father and does not bless its mother. There's a generation that is pure in its own eyes, yet is not washed from its filth. There's a generation, how haughty its eyes and pretentious its looks. There is a generation whose teeth are swords, whose fangs are knives, devouring the oppressed of the land and the needy from among mankind. A generation that is against its parents, yet it thinks itself to be pure. It's haughty and lifted up in their minds. This is the generation that thinks when they look at their parents, I know better. And this generation, we know, is the last generation before the Lord comes. 2 Timothy chapter 3. But know this, hard times will come in the last days, for people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, proud, demeaning, disobedient to parents, ungrateful and unholy. The world's children will be disobedient to their parents, but it is not so with the new man. The new man is transformed, living as the child. The new man transformed will be obedient and honoring to their parents in the Lord. Moving on from the child, let's move to the father. As transformed men, we need to be transformed fathers. Ephesians 6, 4 says, Fathers, do not stir up anger in your children but bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. The fathers he admonishes, he says, don't stir up anger in your children. Don't do it. To stir up is also translated, don't provoke. Other places it says, do not exasperate. That means that you would rouse your child to wrath. Now under Roman law, and there was a section known as patria potestas, the father's power. A Roman father had absolute power over his family. He could sell them as slaves. He could make them work in his fields even while they were in chains. He had the power of the law in his own hands and he could punish as he saw fit. The father could inflict the death penalty on his children as he saw fit. What's more, the power of the Roman father extended over the child's whole life so long as the father lived. Roman sons never became of age. Throw on top also the matter of child repudiation. When a child was born, it would be placed before the father, and if the father stooped and lifted the child, the child was accepted and would be raised. If he, however, turned away, the child would be rejected and literally discarded, either left out to die in the elements or picked up and trafficked as slaves or stalking the brothels. 
fathers certainly had the power and the ability to provoke their children to wrath. And oftentimes they would. Unkindness, overly critical attitudes that sought to torment the child or instill fear in them, the fear so that when their child saw them, they would tremble rather than feel comfort. Paul in Colossians said, fathers, do not exasperate your children. And here's why he's saying this. He's saying, so they don't become discouraged. In a society where the father's authority was absolute, Paul is calling on the new man to transformed living as a father. He says, be transformed. Do not stir up your child in anger. Instead, bring them up in training and instruction in the Lord. Bring up, this word means, fathers, instead of exasperating, you are called to nourish. You are called to nurture or to rear up into maturity. The new man as a transformed father does not stir up or rile up, but instead he brings up and rears up his child. Instead of discouraging our children, we need to be seeking to encourage them. We must watch out for placing unrealistic expectation on our children. We do this when we tend to try to live vicariously through our children. All the things that we never did and we wished we could have, we try to put it on our kids. All the things that we did do and we had such a great time doing, we try to put it on our kids. Trying to relive our glory days through them. May we instead choose to see our children not as something to be molded, but unfolded as God reveals who they are, how they were made, bringing them up, nurturing them. Guys, this is the responsibility of us as fathers. It is not just the mother's responsibility to nurture, nourish, and rear up children. We need to be present in that. The tendency among fathers is to say, working is my job. That's all I got to do. I work. Raising the children is my wife's job. That's not so. Paul here, scripture here, says that the transformed father does differently. Training, relating to the cultivation of the mind, cultivation of the morals of our children through the employment of the commands and the admonition, as well in discipline and correction. We have to be spiritual examples as fathers. You can't just leave it to Sunday school. You can't just leave it to youth groups or to our, our wives, their moms. The word training here is the same word that we find as discipline in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 5 through 11. I don't have the verses up there, but it it's the chapter that speaks of how the Lord disciplines those whom he loves just the same way using the example of the fathers of the, the Lord's discipline is compared to that of the father. And as transformed fathers, we do not over discipline, nor do we fail to discipline our children. You see, to fail to discipline our children would also mean to fail our children. There's examples throughout scripture of fathers who failed to discipline their children and it cost their child's life. It led to long periods of trouble from their children. David, of all the things that David is known for, one of the things that he was known for was not disciplining his children. And he had Adonijah who raped his sister. And we have Absalom who tried to steal the kingdom from him. Eli had two sons that he did not discipline. 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 13, the Lord speaking to him. He says, I told him that I'm going to judge his family forever because of the iniquity he knows about. His sons are cursing God and he has not stopped them. Proverbs 13, 24 tells us this. The one who will not use the rod hates his son. But the one who loves him disciplines him diligently. 
training and instruction in the Lord are how transformed fathers are to bring up their children. That's how we do it. In the training and the instruction of the Lord, you're not being left to figure it out on your own. God's given you his word. It has all the instructions that we need for living life and and living godly. 2 Timothy 3.16, all all scriptures inspired by God, profitable for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be complete and equipped for every good work. It's not only good for us, it's good for our children. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, he says, look, He's pointing the Corinthian church back to the example of the Israelites. He said, look at what the Israelites did. And how do we know what they did? He says, these things happened to them as examples. And they were written into the scripture for our instruction. One of the best ways that we can be an example of this for our kids and that we can raise them in this is by being present. It's by being there. You know, there was a a story told about an elementary class having show and tell, and all the kids were having a great time. They they had them all lined up, and as they shared one by one, you could almost sense they were trying to outdo each other about who had the best dad. My daddy's the president of his own company. He travels all over the world. I have gifts from all the different places of the world. Another said, well, my dad, he's a police officer and he does this. And they said, oh, my dad works in the hospital and he does this. And, and one child in the back said, my dad's here. How about you? Are you there, dad? Are you present? I grew up with a father who was home but he was in another room all the time. He was doing something else all the time. Fathers, we can be home and still not be there. Are we providing an example? Are we there? Are we spending time with our children? Are we talking to them about the things of the Lord? The example for us written down in Deuteronomy 6, verse 6 says, these words that I'm giving you today, they're to be in your heart. Repeat them to your children. Talk about them when you sit in your house and when you walk along the road, when you lie down, when you get up. The word of God should be on your lips all the time, especially, especially with our children. We must be transformed as fathers. But Paul moves on and he also talks about us as workers. The transformed worker. And in verse 5, he says, Slaves, obey your human masters with fear and trembling in the sincerity of your heart as you would Christ. Don't work only while being watched as people pleasers, but as slaves of Christ. Do God's will from your heart. Serve with a good attitude as to the Lord and not to people, knowing that whatever good each one does, slave or free, he'll receive his back from the Lord. Now, as we begin looking at this scripture, first it has to be prefaced. I didn't pick this scripture. I didn't, I didn't say, hey, let me talk about that one that speaks about slaves. It just happened to be given to me. Uh, the other thing is, is outside of a church setting, we probably couldn't be really talking about this. The rest of the world won't, won't hear it, won't accept it. But I want to let you know that in Paul's time, that slavery that was practiced there had little and nothing to look like what happened in the United States. Slavery back then was not imposed upon people of one ethnicity. In Paul's day, the Romans considered slaves to be human beings. In contrast to the Greeks, however, the Greeks saw them as property. In Rome, a free person could sell themselves into slavery in order to pay off a debt. But while later, they could still regain their freedom once again. It wasn't something they gave up and they never got back. Not only could slaves become free, but they could also receive their Roman citizenship. That's a status that was only held among the elite. The life of a slave depended upon the master. While there were many great masters, of course there were always cruel masters and cruel treatment, and Paul neither advocates nor uh, for slavery nor the abolition of slavery. He does encourage believers, however, don't become slaves, and those who are slaves try to become free. I say all that to say this. 
this section of scripture as we look at, it's not focused on slavery and whether we should have it or shouldn't have it or if it's alive and well or any. It doesn't focus on that. Paul, his focus is this. It's the nature of a transformed man's work, not slavery that he's addressing. Christianity does not promise a release from any of our present circumstances. Did you know that? It gives us the power to endure our circumstances in Christ Jesus. But praise God that this practice is almost completely non-existent today, at least in the U.S. So in order to apply these now, the usual practice is to apply it to employees and managers. So we're going to look at the employees, the workers. Paul says, slaves, obey your human masters. Again, we see the word obey, and we're reminded of what the usage is. Paul calls on them to obey with fear and trembling and the sincerity of heart, as you would if it was Christ. Not cowering in servility and with abject terror, but it's rather a dutiful respect and a fear of offending the employer or the Lord. Among us that desire to live a transformed life, there's no place for even a subtle insubordination towards our employers. God's word calls for us to conduct ourselves in this way, not because we think that they've earned it, but because they're in the position, period. The service that we render at our jobs, and I'm going to use this word that we explored earlier again, it should be in sincerity, sincerity of heart. <clears throat> Those hamburgers were good. <laughs> what this means when we render our services in sincerity of heart it means for every hour of pay that one receives, one should give an hour's worth of work. This should be done as one would do if it was Christ as their employer himself. This attitude begins to blur the lines between the secular and the sacred. Because we can have that, oh, it's just work. It's just work, and so it doesn't really matter. Now, when we come to church and we serve, we, we give it our all. God's saying do it in both places. <clears throat> the transformed worker knows and sees that even the most menial common tasks become dignified work when done for the glory of God. Don't work only while being watched as people pleasers. But as slaves of Christ, do God's will from your heart. The interesting thing about this is, is I grew up, when I was younger, I used to read Mad Magazine. I'm not recommending anybody read that magazine, but I used to read it. And there, they had one uh, thing that they did in addition on there, and it was uh, how security cameras have changed different places. The first one it shows is in the church. They, they would pass the giving plate with a security camera attached to it, and all of a sudden everybody's like giving all the money that they could. But there was another one they showed in the workplace and the boss puts a camera up in the corner and so all the workers are just sitting there working and you see the sweat pouring off their and, and that's what it is. People tend to work hard. People tend to, if someone's watching, they're different. The transformed man is the same whether anybody's watching or not. Work honestly, work sincerely, not by the way of eye service. Don't slack off on the job. Slacking off is a form of dishonesty. It's a form of theft. The transformed worker knows that while the boss isn't looking, Christ our master is. We don't need a security camera in the corner of the office because we know that God Almighty is looking down. Our attitude should be that this. It doesn't matter if our boss treats us as a slave or treats us as a menial worker because we've made ourselves voluntarily slaves of Christ. And so we work for him. No matter what our situation is, it doesn't matter who we work for, it doesn't matter where we're at, we can be slaves of Christ to do God's will from our heart. 
from a place of sincerity, working to please Christ by doing God's will. I like how Spurgeon put it. Spurgeon says, grace makes us the servants of God while yet the servants of men. It enables us to do the business of heaven while we are attending to the business of earth. It sanctifies the common duties of life by showing us how to perform them in the light of heaven. Serve with a good attitude as if it's to the Lord and not to people, knowing that whatever good you do, whether slave or free, you're going to receive back from the Lord. An outward display with inward seething resentment, that's not our calling. We're called to be the same on the outside as we are on the inside, transformed. We're to be cheerful. We're to be willing. Even if a master is overbearing, abusive, and unreasonable, the transformed worker can and must do the work as unto the Lord and not to men. The new man is a transformed worker. And what we want is we want to be known as the best employees. And they're going to say, what makes them the best employees? Why are these employees so great? And they're going to be like, why is it all my Christian employees work so hard? Our work then becomes a reflection of our faith. We become honest, hardworking, with a great work ethic, a, a servant heart, and a respect for all, especially those in management. And it becomes our faith and our following of God's word. And that helps us to navigate all the difficult managers. Because I know exactly what everybody's thinking right now. But you don't know my boss. I think uh, us pastors are the only ones who have a job that we can't complain about who our boss is. But the truth is, is we all work for God. He ultimately is our boss. So we can do the work as unto God because that's the way he sees it anyway. God doesn't care if you're doing it unto your boss. He says, what are you doing unto me? What will be your reward? Colossians 3.23. Whatever you do, do it from the heart as something done for the Lord and not for people, knowing that you'll receive the reward of an inheritance from the Lord, you serve the Lord Christ. Do you know that there is no reward from God for those who seek it from men? Dr. David Martin Lloyd-Jones said that in his studies on the Sermon on the Mount. He said, there is no reward from God for those who seek it from men. Finally, we're going to take a look at a transformed boss. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 9 says, And masters, treat your slaves the same way, without threatening them, because you know that both their master and yours is in heaven, and there is no favoritism with him. Those who have a leadership supervisory role would fit in there, where he says masters. Those who have people that are under them in uh, submission and reporting to them. So he, he admonishes them. He says, treat the workers the same way. I don't have to rehash all that. The same thing he said to the workers about honesty and, and attitude and all that. The same way, employers, be the same way. Be respectful with fear and trembling. Be honest. Be a transformed leader who fairly compensates and rightfully leads their employees. It may seem like a no duh, but you know what? In my experience, I've come across many employers bragging about hiring someone straight out of college with a bachelor's degree and paying them minimum wage. As a computer technician, I've worked for companies that offered a salaried position, but really it should have been called sourly because they tried to mix it up. Employers, you have to choose one or the other. The laws of the land say that you can't have it both ways. They're either salary or they're hourly. 
Both have their pluses and minuses, so choose carefully. Otherwise, they choose for you. Up until this time, perhaps the masters were thinking, yeah, this Paul guy, he's so great. Look at that. Yeah, Paul, you tell all those workers. Tell them to get back to work. And then Paul turns around and says, I'm talking to you. He says, you likewise do fairly, honestly, respectfully. Treat them the same way. He says, don't play favorites. Don't show partiality. And then he says, some, he's, he says and, and, and you don't have to threaten them. If you treat your workers this way, you don't have to threaten them. You don't have to threaten to beat them or anything to get them to go to work. He says, there's no need. He says, understand this. They know and now you know. You answer to someone higher in heaven. Everybody answers to God. There's no partiality with God. There's no favoritism with God. You could be the lar- CEO of a large company and everyone there answers to you, but guess what? You answer to God. James chapter 2, verse 13, James writes in his epistle, he says, for judgment is without mercy to the one who has not shown mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. So the transformed boss has mercy, shows mercy. Many times I come across people and when I talk with them about living as the new man, they're, they're waiting. They're waiting to live their new life when their circumstances change, when their situation changes. The truth of the matter is this. Your life has already been transformed if you are in Christ Jesus. Your circumstances and your situations have not been changed. You have. You are a new creation. You are a new man in Christ Jesus. And Paul is speaking to those in Jesus even though they're still in those situations. When he was speaking to the children whom we may picture, as I said, as young age kids, he's talking to children in a time who never came of age. Who had overbearing fathers. And he says, respect your fathers. Obey them. Honor them. He didn't say honor them when they stop acting that way. He said, you can honor them right now. Paul called them transform living. Fathers who had all authority and they could do whatever they wanted. The law would not stop them. Paul called them to transformed living in Christ Jesus. And the same with the workers and the bosses, the slaves and the masters. (coughs) Doesn't matter what age they were. Paul called them to transformed living. It wasn't too late. They didn't have to wait. They could do it now. 2 Corinthians 4.16 says, Therefore, we do not lose heart. Even though our outward man is perishing, the inward man is being renewed day by day. It's not too late. You can't say, I'm too old. I'm, I'm, I'm almost gone. This life is almost over. Because though your outside is perishing, your inward is being renewed day by day through the Spirit. Transformed living requires being transformed, though. And I know the question's been asked several times and the, and, and the response has been that there's going to be an opportunity for repentance. But you need to know that it's not possible to live a transformed life if you yourself have not been transformed yet. You have to be born again, made into a new creation, made a new man. That takes coming to Jesus. That takes surrendering yourself to him. All that you are, all that you've done, all of your failures, all of your sins, all of your hurts, you have to come to the cross and ask for the forgiveness of Jesus. But the promise is this, you shall be forgiven. You shall be saved. You shall be born again. All who call upon the name of Jesus Christ shall be saved. And Jesus himself said, all who call on me, I will by no means cast away. So that means that you're not gonna come to Christ and he's gonna say, whoa, anybody but you. He's going to say, come. And that's what he calls. He calls and he says, come to me and I will transform you. 
Heavenly Father, we come before you. And Lord, we just thank you as this conference continues on. Lord, I just pray for your word to continue to be poured out in power. I pray that you would pour out your spirit upon all of us, Lord, that you would continue to pour out your transforming spirit into our hearts and into our lives. And Lord, we pray that you would just change the community, change the churches, change the families. And then, Lord, we also ask that you would change each and every one of us individually in the power and the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.